Hi, welcome to Prophecies of Hope. I'm so glad that you've chosen to uh, go on this little journey with us. And maybe you're just going to be looking at this first session and decide if you want to continue studies. And if that's the case, that's completely okay. Because, you know, God's leading each one of us. And sometimes we have an experience with God in the past and we just want to expand on it. And other times it's just, well, I wonder what this Christianity is about. So no matter where you are in your place with God and relationship with Him, I welcome you to Prophecies of Hope. And I also want to introduce uh, Dee Casper and Christy Rodriguez. Welcome to Prophecies of Hope as well. Good to be here. Thank uh, we're going to have a good time together. We're going to study the Bible, the key prophecies of the Bible together and see how God leads us. Uh, one of the things that I like to share with people about Prophecies of Hope is, our goal is not to tell people what to believe. We've got enough people in our lives trying to tell us what to believe, right? And so sometimes even Christians come across as real heavy-handed. They're going to tell everybody what to believe. And, and then that gets confusing because there's so many different beliefs, right, within Christianity. And so I don't like that, and I know a lot of people don't like that. So our goal here is just to get into the Bible and let the Bible explain itself. And a lot of people don't realize that, that when you look at the Scripture, the scripture actually unlocks its own meanings. It, it, it explains itself. And so my goal with you and in our studies is just to give people the tools so that when they're studying the Bible on their own, they're reading it, they can look and go, oh, I know how to figure this out because there's so much here. You can't give enough Bible studies to cover it all. So, but if we can give people the tools to understand the Bible, then it unlocks everything in the Bible, and it can be a, a lifelong experience growing reading the Word of God. So, so that's our purpose, and my goal for you and my goal for this series is that if you can just get closer to God and learn better how to understand the Bible and the Bible prophecies, then we've accomplished our goal because we know that the Holy Spirit will lead each of us in, in the way that he wants us to go. And if you're a new Christian, some of the terminology that I use, like Holy Spirit and all, hopefully that will become obvious to you as we go along. Or if you're not a Christian, some of this terminology will be explained as we study. Hey, one of the things I like to do when we study the Bible, I believe it's a spiritual book, and I believe there is a God out there who wants us to understand it, is to pray and ask God to lead and guide us and to send His Spirit to help us. And so Dee, would you mind praying and asking God to be with us? I'd be happy to. Thank you. Let's pray. God in heaven, we just thank you uh, to have this opportunity to seek understanding as we're studying your word. And we pray that you would send your Spirit to guide us, that you would give us wisdom and understanding, and that you would allow this text uh, to speak to our hearts and our minds and the things that we deal with in our day-to-day -day life. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. So I want to start with just kind of why, why would you even want to study Bible prophecy? You know, because it may sound like it's like the most complicated part of the Bible, right? And when we think of Bible prophecy, which book do we normally think of? It's the last book of the Bible, right? Yeah, Revelation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, and when you get in there, I remember when I first thought, I want to understand prophecy. I picked up and I started reading Revelation and, you know, that was during the big drug culture. I thought somebody was tripping on acid or something because, you know, there's all these beasts coming up out of the sea and all that, and I could not make sense of it. I didn't understand the keys to unlock it. So why would you want to spend your time in that rather than the Gospels? Well, they're all inspired, and they all should get our attention at some phase in our life and point in our life. But Bible prophecy, what I find is Bible prophecy brings the whole Bible together. You know, the book of Revelation we we're just talking about has uh, 404 verses. And somebody at research has said 276 of those verses are referring back to other scripture in the Old Testament. Mm. So there's a lot of connectedness to other parts of the Bible. Someone once said all the books of the Bible meet and end in Revelation. So when you study Revelation or other prophecies, it takes you out into the rest of the Bible. And then it creates this timeline, this historical sequence, and then you start making sense of the Bible. But even more importantly, it starts making sense of man's history. Why are we here? What's the purpose of life? What's going on in our world and where is it going? And then it gets really personal. Who am I? Why am I here? What's God's purpose in my life? And so prophecy, I think, is, is really powerful in that way. It becomes very relevant. But then even transcending that, probably the best reason to study prophecy is because God says we should study prophecy. 
So I want to look at two Bible texts that tell us that we need to be studying Bible prophecy. And you don't have to be a scholar to study it. Uh, you just need to understand the keys of how to do it. And that's what we'll be sharing with you in Prophecies of Hope. So if you have your Bible and we have ours here, uh, why don't we turn to Revelation chapter 1 to begin with. And we'll just read a, a text there in Revelation 1 that endorses the study of Bible prophecy. Revelation chapter 1, that's the last book of the Bible. So why don't we read uh, verse 3? And Christy, I wonder if you could read that for us. Revelation 1 verse 3. It says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. What's the first word there? Blessed. Blessed. And what does that mean? Blessed. Fortunate. <laughs> Fortunate. D? Favored. Favored. Yeah, in some translation, happy. Mm -hmm. Happy is he. So you got this, you're, you're fortunate, you're favored, you're happy. Something good's going to happen here, right? Yeah. I, I've met people, maybe you have too, that said, oh, you don't want to read Revelation. That's just going to confuse you. Yeah. I was that way. I just, I just thought I'm just going to treat the Bible as if there's 65 books and just kind of, you know, hold it off. Because there's 66, right? Right, yeah. I'll, I'll just hold it off for later because I just wasn't sure what to do with it. For a long time early on in my Christian experience, I felt the same way. It's like, I'm not going to be able to understand this. It's crazy, mm -hmm. confusing. I'll just, I'll just skip it for now. Yeah. Yeah. And yet, yet God says there's a blessing in this book. And then he tells us there's three things that we should do, right? So what are the three things we do to get the blessing? To read, to hear, and to keep the words that are written. Yeah. And this is a principle of Bible study. I just want to pause here because I mentioned we want to give people the tools, right? So a lot of people, when they read the Bible, the first thing they do is they go, well, what does it mean? And it's hard to get the meaning if you haven't first asked another question, what does it say? That's right. Yeah. And so the first thing you do when you're reading a Bible text is just to chart, what does it say? And then once you get what it says, then you can go, okay, I wonder what that means. And there are different ways to explore meaning. We'll talk about that. But then there's actually a third question. And that question is, what difference does it make in my life? So those are three questions you keep in mind when you're reading a text. So, so he's just said what it says. You're going to be happy. You're going to be blessed if you read it and you hear it and you keep it. So reading and keeping is pretty obvious, right? I'm going to physically read it. Or I'm going to listen to it. Or I'm going to keep it. Hearing, I think, has a little deeper meaning than just physically hearing. What do you think that might mean? You're going to read and you're going to hear it. To internalize it. Mm -hmm. Maybe to like the, the sense of active hearing, to actually internalize and process, not yes. just to the, the sound comes into your ears. Yeah. Did your, did your mom ever say to you, your dad, are you listening to me? <laughs> are you hearing me? They, they don't mean just audibly, right? Right. Yeah. They might. They might today if you're stuck on a device, <laughs> a kid's stuck on a device. Yeah. But uh, it's like, are you getting what I'm actually saying, right? Are you really hearing me? So that's what God's saying. So, so there are only you know, a few books in the Bible where you have this, this uh, direct blessing and injunction that you need to read this book. You need to understand this book. And so this is one of them. And the other one is found in uh, Matthew 24. Jesus endorses another book. And interestingly enough, it's also a prophetic book. Matthew 24 and verse 15. And in Matthew 24, the whole chapter of Matthew 24 is Jesus giving prophecy that reaches down to the last days. So, Dee, could you read verse 15 for us, please? Sure. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Yeah, now we're kind of chopping that at mid sentence because in mid thought, there's, a, there's more to come. And we'll talk about in our studies of Prophecy of Hope what the abomination of desolation is. But the thing that I want us to notice here is what does it say? Jesus is saying, when you see this thing and it's spoken by Daniel, when you see this thing happen, verse 16, then you're supposed to do certain things. But watch this parenthetical. In my Bible, it's probably in yours as well. There's a parenthetical statement after he says, uh, when you see this spoken of by Daniel, the prophet stand in the holy place. Whoever reads, let him understand. So Jesus is like he's, he's talking and then he just says, by the way, you need to be reading the book of Daniel and you need to understand it. 
Mm. Very similar to Revelation. I think that's what the hear means is, do you hear me? Are you understanding it? So read it and understand it. So those are the two books of the Bible that Jesus specifically endorses our reading, our understanding, and our keeping of those prophecies. And what's very interesting is those are two prophetic books and they're actually related. Mm -hmm. the, the images and the prophecies you see in Daniel are also in Revelation. Wow. They're like holding hands. <laughs> it is, it is. And, and across, you know, six, Daniel's written in the six, 7th century BC, 600s, mm -hmm. and, and then in the 500s, and then John writes Revelation around 90 AD. So you got about six, 700 years there, and they reach across the ages. And we'll see they actually reach down to our time. So we want to go to Daniel because Daniel's the easier book to understand. And Daniel unlocks Revelation. If you just start in Revelation, it's really hard to understand Daniel. So how do we find Daniel? Put us on a path to finding Daniel. If you find the book of Psalms, just go to your right. Um, so if you're in the middle of the Bible, around the book of Psalms, just go to your right. You've got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and then Daniel. There you go. And it's a little book, right? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a little book. So you can flip through it if you're flipping, but if you're, if you're, Ezekiel's big. If you're flipping through Ezekiel, then you'll see, uh, you start slowing down near the end of Ezekiel, you'll hit Daniel. We're going to Daniel 2. We're going to skip Daniel 1. I recommend people read Daniel 1. It's very interesting because the story of Daniel in the background, so we understand Daniel 2, is Daniel's a Hebrew, and he grows up in the city, the capital city, Jerusalem. And this is about 605, uh, is Daniel 1, 605 B.C. And he's a young man. He's probably a teenager, scholars say. He's probably about 17 years old. And his city is attacked by Babylon. And Babylon is, is on this quest of gobbling up everything around it. And so King Nebuchadnezzar is the king. He attacks Jerusalem, attacks the country, and he specifically sieges Jerusalem and he takes back a bunch of captives to Babylon. And one of the captives is Daniel, and then his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they are all taken back, and then they're, they're put in a Babylonian school. And so he's going to, to utilize them to build his own kingdom. And so they go through Babylonian education, they graduate with high honors, and now they're made wise men, and so they're part of the people that he consults as he's running his, his multinational kingdom now. And so Daniel's just graduated from that school when we come to Daniel 2. So 605 BC for Daniel 1, Daniel 2's, you know, a number a few years later, and we have them here around 602 BC, somewhere in there. And so this is what happens. And it's a very interesting thing. The king's going to have a dream, and it's not just any old dream. Uh, he senses there's real significance to this dream. And so that becomes the drama of how do I figure out what this dream means? And there's a whole story there that we don't have time to go into the story. We're going to jump to the prophetic part of it. But Daniel is called in to give the king understanding of the dream. And that's where the prophecy begins. And I call this the master key to unlock all your prophecies, the timeline prophecies from Daniel's day down to our day. And it's so simple, a child can understand it, but it's powerful. It's a key that unlocks it all. So Christy, why don't you start us? We're going to read uh, Daniel 2, 1 through 3, just to kind of set up the story here. Okay. Let's read. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, and the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I have had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Now we all have dreams, but this is an unusual dream because he calls all the wise men in the middle of the night. And as you read the story, you find out they can't do it. But then he calls Daniel in. Daniel's a new graduate, calls Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in. And they say, Lord, uh, king, give us some time to seek our God. Uh, because the wise men all claim to have connection with the gods. So look, give us some time to seek our God, and, and he'll be able to tell you what this is. And so they go and have a prayer meeting, is what they do. Mm -hmm. The next evening, they sleep, and they sleep peacefully, even though the king has said, 
whoever, if you can't tell me the dream, I'm going to kill you. But, you know, it's like that in life. You know, we have these threats in our lives, these bad experiences in our life. But you, you grow in your faith. You get to the point where you just trust him. And it's just like, my life is in your hand. And, and if you believe in eternal life, the fact that you lose this life is not really that big of a deal because you've got eternal life. And we're going to see that throughout Daniel is that uh, they meet different crises that threaten their life. And they're just like, it's okay. God's got this. And, and God has it. And, you know, you might be going through something really big right now, too. But God's got this. And, and maybe this Bible study time together and drawing close to God is part of God's plan to get you through whatever you're going through right now. I've seen that happen in my life and other people's lives. So let's jump to Daniel coming in now. And we're going to go to verse 27, where Daniel now is going to explain the dream. All right. So why don't we read uh, verses 27 through 30. And Dee, could you read that for us, please? Sure. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he's made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes to make known the interpretation to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. So, so what do you get out of this text? What, what is Daniel saying this dream is about? There are a number of things in here. He underscores that here's why God's giving this dream. What, what are some of the things you guys pick up? Well, it pertains to what will be in the latter days and about what would come to pass after this and what will be. So there's three allusions to it. It involves something that's in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, that's alluded to. And also that it seems as though God even cares about the things that are just troubling his heart. Mm. That this guy who doesn't know God, doesn't serve God, at least the God that Daniel serves, Daniel is giving this interpretation to help ease the anxiety that this king is feeling. Um, so in almost a sense, I, I get this sense that God cares deeply even about this individual who doesn't follow him mm -hmm. and wants to ease his anxiety that's keeping him up at night. Yeah, isn't that cool though? Yeah. Yeah, here, here's, here's a, a king who isn't a believer in the true God at all. In fact, he's antagonistic to it. In Daniel 1, he attacks God's temple mm -hmm. and God's people and carries back the elements used in the worship of the true God and puts them in his pagan temple. So this, this guy's not really kind to God, but how does God feel towards him? Mm -hmm. He's kind to him, right? God, God's trying to help this guy's heart, and, and that's who our God is. You, know, you can't run too far from God that God doesn't still love you. That's right. You know, God, God respects our choices, right? Uh, but he will also try to intervene mm -hmm. to get us to come back to him. And so that's what God's doing here. Great, great points. Christy, anything that you get out of this text of, what, what God's after in giving this dream that would add to what Dee met, mentioned? Yeah, I think it's interesting how in verse 28 it says how there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. Mm. It shows that He's all-knowing. He has like the power and the ability to share the things that we have no idea about. So like there are things that we just like, oh, I don't know how this is going to be resolved or like how is this going to work out? Mm -hmm. But He knows already before we even had a knowledge that He could help and us. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, here Daniel's in a crisis. He's going to lose his life. And he prays to God, and God steps into that crisis. He reveals the secrets. Yeah, it's a one, wonderful thing. And so the, the, the three points, D, that you mentioned, uh, this pertains to the latter days. So it's a prediction of the future all the way to the last days. But also you mentioned the other text there. He says the hereafter. And so the here means here in Daniel's day, in King Nebuchadnezzar's day, after all the way down to the latter days. Mm -hmm. So this prophecy is going to span from the 600s BC all the way down to the last days. That's what we should expect huh. from what he said, right? The other thing is, is what you both mentioned, is that he says, God's giving you this dream for your sake. So it's to reveal to the king the thoughts of his own heart and to convert him, to bring him to God into a relationship with the true God. 
Mm-hmm. And that's fascinating in itself. Like if, if God can give the interpretation to Daniel, why didn't he just give the dream to Daniel? Mm. But it was because of his interest in Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel already follows God. Yes. And so God, in his attempts to reach Nebuchadnezzar, also has Daniel there. Like Daniel's in exile. He's a prisoner of war. Mm-hmm. And yet during this captivity, God is not passive. God is still seeking to win people. Israel's in captivity because they were unfaithful. Mm. And in the midst of them receiving punishment in exile, right, and being separated from their homeland, God's still seeking to win souls. God's still seeking to win people. So he gives the dream to Nebuchadnezzar and has placed Daniel there to begin this process of facilitating this work of trying to win Nebuchadnezzar's heart, which is amazing. Yeah, it's cool, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always wondered why he would give this king of foreign king didn't follow God, this prophecy, right? This, basically the rest of history mm. <laughs> to someone who doesn't even know he is supreme. Yeah, but there's, I think there's the, that's a really good point. And I think part of the answer it occurs to me that I'm thinking is it's for influence too. Mm-hmm. You know, we're interested in what a king yeah. has seen, you know, you, you follow kings and queens and you know, there's the paparazzi and all that. So we're getting, God, God's using somebody of influence. And we'll see in other studies where this, this prophecy obviously gets known all over the place. Everybody figures out what the king saw and heard. It becomes a big deal. And it also leads ultimately to the king's conversion. In Daniel chapter 4, he actually comes to a faith in the true God. And so we're, we're getting to read the process that God is working in his life. All right, so let's, let's look at the prophecy and let's see, does it cover from Babylon's day all the way down to the last days? Uh, let's jump in at verse 30, 31. Who, who read last? Was I did. It? You did? Okay, so Christy, why don't you read 31 through 35 for us? Got it. You, O king, were watching and behold, a great image, this great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. This image head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partially of iron and partially of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. All right, so, so here's a picture of this, this multi-metaled man. <laughs> he has a head of what? Gold. Gold, breasts and arms of? Silver. Silver. Belly and thighs of? Bronze. Bronze. And then legs of? Iron. iron. And then what are the feet? It's like iron and clay mixed together. Iron and clay I think mixed. of like mud. <laughs> mud, yeah, with some metal in it, right? Yeah. And then what happens next? The stone mm-hmm. cut, cut out of a mountain and goes hurdling at the uh, image and hits it where? At the feet. On its feet, right? And then that makes the thing fall, and then the stone just actively grinds it, right? And then the wind comes along, blows all that away, and then the stone is the only thing remaining, and it grows and grows and fills the whole earth. Mm. Hmm. So the king up to this time has not been able to remember his dream. He was left with the impression it's a very important dream, but he can't remember the dream. But now he has it all come rushing back in and it's fresh, just like he remembered it from the beginning. And he's got to be very excited about this dream that's, yeah, that's it, that's it. And it's like, what does it mean? What does it mean? That's what I'd be asking. That's what I'm asking right now. What does it mean? What does it mean? And and that's where Daniel says, we're going to get to that. Wait a second. We got to follow our biblical rules for prophecy and understand the Bible. First, what does it Say. say, right? And then you can get into what does it mean? And so one of the things on how you figure out what does it mean is you read the immediate context. Because a lot of times immediate context will give you the meaning. But what I find a lot of people do is they just want to stop right there and go, okay, what does it mean? And then they make up an interpretation. (laughs) It's like when I first read Revelation, I didn't realize you start in Daniel. And I was reading through Revelation. I was going, what does that mean? Well, maybe it means this, maybe it means that. And I had enough logic in my mind that when I continued reading, the meaning I was ascribing to certain things wasn't consistent down the line. And then I just said, somebody's going to have to help me understand that because it's not making sense. But Daniel helps it to make sense because he immediately in verse 36, look at it there. It says, Daniel says, this is the dream. 
Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. So we don't have to make up an interpretation. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, I think it's verse 20, it says, and the scripture is not a private interpretation. So that when God gave the inspiration to the people who wrote these things, God had something in mind he wanted to communicate. And we're to figure out what God wants to communicate, not what we think he, he said, and make up our own interpretation. So this is a really cool prophecy, and it gives us that, that understanding that the Bible will interpret itself. So let's read the interpretation, D. Why don't you start there for us in verse uh, 37, and uh, we'll just kind of pause at different places. I'll pause you, and we'll comment on it as we go through. Beginning in verse 37, Daniel says that you, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Uh, that doesn't sound too favorable for a king who thought he earned it himself. So mm -hmm. that's kind of a, <laughs> that's hard, right. a hard saying already. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he's given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay." And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seeds of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as the iron does not mix with the clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Okay, let's pause there. Perfect. All right, so first question we ask is, what does it say? So this is the interpretation. What does the interpretation say? What do these metals represent? They're representing kingdoms, it sounds like. Yeah. Right. Or rulers or kingdoms. And what tells you that? Uh, he says that you are this head of gold in verse 38. And then he says, after you shall arise another kingdom. So the implication is these metals are kind of these markers of different mm -hmm. kingdoms ruling at different times. Yeah. So that's exactly it. And he says, and then a third kingdom and then a fourth kingdom, right? And then the kingdom will be divided. And then God's kingdom. So you have... This is a history of the kingdoms from Babylon to the latter days. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the last thing you, you read there was, this is what will come to pass after this. So from you, King Nebuchadnezzar, after this. What does it say about the quality of the kingdoms, Christy, that's going to happen? Uh, ver verse uh, 39, why don't you read that first phrase in verse 39? But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. Yeah. So what's happening with the quality of these metals? Are they getting more expensive or less? <laughs> less expensive, definitely weaker. Yeah, weaker. Mm -hmm. so, so you have this degradation of value as time goes along. I mean, we got from gold to mud. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And there's not even gold in the mud. It's, it's, just, it's just plain yeah. iron, we're, we're nearly worthless iron, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's the kingdoms of men that's being represented here. And I wonder if it's not saying something about what's happened to society. Mm. You know, if you, if, you, if you read the Bible, you take the Bible's account of human history, God created the world perfect. You know, no sin, no pain, no suffering. Everything was good. And, and look at where we are today. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's interesting that they decrease in value, but they increase in strength, mm. which is interesting too. Because, um, you know, like gold isn't the strongest of metals, but mm -hmm. iron is a strong metal. So there's a sense in which like the quality decreases to some degree mm -hmm. of what you see, but they're kind of like hardness. They get harder. Increases. Yes. Yeah. But what about the, the strength of the feet? It's brittle. Yeah. Would you buy, could you really build anything significant on that? No. It's going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I think that says something too in that 
you know, right now you look at human history, what's happening around us, it's all falling apart. We're so fragmented. You know, just like in this, it says the iron won't cleave, won't stick to the clay. And that's the way it is today. And humankind is just, we're all at war with each other. We don't even get along in our own societies. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's because of that hardness of heart towards God. That's right. You know, we're not as easily shaped to follow God. That's right. And so there's less kindness, you know, less, less peace. So, all right, so that's, that's Daniel's interpretation. These are kingdoms, and he gives us a starting point. What's the starting point? It's Babylon, right? Mm -hmm. You are the head of gold, O king. So now all we need to do is go to history to find the fulfillment. We don't have to interpret it because Daniel gave us the interpretation, yeah. right? So we just need to go to history to find the fulfillment. And that's how you do Bible prophecy. You read it. What does it say? You chart what it says. And then you look at the biblical interpretation. You use the rules of interpretation that are in the Bible. And then you go to history and find the historical fulfillment. And when you do that, it becomes very clear what's being said here. All right, so we have Babylon. Babylon's the kingdom of gold. I don't think it's a mistake that God used gold to represent Babylon because it's gone down in history known as the golden kingdom. That's right. The reason King Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem was because he had sent ambassadors several years before and the king of Israel, Hezekiah, Hezekiah had done what? What did he do? He had this, this wealth of these treasuries. So he had been sick, he recovered. Uh, Babylon sent ambassadors that to say, we're glad you're feeling better. Mm -hmm. And he showed him everything, like open all the Took closets. all the treasure houses. Yeah, all the yeah. treasure houses. Here's all the gold and fancy stuff that I have. And he was warned after the fact that this is going to lead to hardship. And yeah. it did. Yeah. So they like, hey, there's gold there. <laughs> yeah. So they come back and the Babylonians attack them and take all that gold. And uh, historians, there was a, a Greek poet and historian, uh, Aeschylus, I think was his name. He said, you know, they were known for their great amounts of gold in Babylon, and Herodotus was another Greek. So they were known for their gold. So that's why God represents Babylon by the gold. And that probably made King Nebuchadnezzar feel pretty good, right? Yeah, I'm the golden kingdom. I've got lots of gold. But then the next thing he's told that you just read, uh, Christy, is an inferior kingdom is going to overthrow me. That probably didn't make him feel too good, right? So, but, and we'll come back to that in our next study of, of what he does to kind of counter uh, act that, but that's the kingdom of silver, and which kingdom followed, if you go to history, which kingdom followed Babylon? It was Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia. And, and even, even Daniel's book tells us this. Yes. Uh, Daniel, eventually, uh, history helps us, but even sometimes the text will help us. So later in Daniel, the Medo-Persians overthrow Babylon, and then uh, we'll see the other kingdom next in line also alluded to in Daniel. Yeah, so 538 to 331 is the Medo-Persian kingdom. And they're the Medes and the Persians. They were two groups of people that joined together to overthrow Babylon. And then ultimately the Medes kind of lose their place. They get weakened. And we know it as the Persian Empire today. And again, silver was a significant metal to the Persians. They required their tax money to be paid in silver. Yeah. You know, you know what the United States requires its tax money to be paid in? Blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, they, they wanted it paid in silver. And then the third kingdom, what was that metal? It was bronze. Bronze, okay. Some bronze, some brass, and you get technical, they're a little different, but basically same thing here. And, and that kingdom, which kingdom followed the Persian Empire? Do you remember? The Greek kingdom. The, the Greek kingdom, yeah, the Greek kingdom. And that's alluded to in Daniel also, uh, in chapter 8, I think. That's right. We'll study Daniel 8, and in that one it's exciting because the angel actually says the kingdom of Greece. Right. Yeah. I was just in Greece uh, last year, and I went to where the uh, tomb of the first king of Greece was discovered, and it had never been robbed. So it was an amazing find. So you're going way back to the 300 B.C. era, and they found uh, King Philip's, uh, the Macedonian Greek king, his tomb. And I was just, I was not astounded because I, I, I know about this from prophecy, but all the armaments were made, mo the majority of them were made of bronze. Hmm. Oh, wow. You know, the, the helmets, the breastplate, uh, the shin guards, all made of bronze. And some of them had gold decorating it, but the dominant metal was bronze. Hmm. And so the king of Greece was known for its bronze, its bronze breastplates and its armament and everything. That's what they were known for. 
and it's just everywhere through that museum. So that's, that's the kingdom of Greece, and God again chooses an appropriate metal to represent that kingdom. And then what's the, what's the next metal on the image? The legs of what? Iron. Legs of iron, right? And then which kingdom followed Greece? It's the kingdom of Rome. And we see that in the New Testament, all throughout the New Testament, Rome was ruling at that stage. Mm -hmm. Was Rome known for its iron? Uh, metallurgy, yeah, of, of iron. That was a big thing for them. Yeah. So the iron swords, iron, iron uh, spears, you know, all of that. Iron nails pierced Jesus with. Uh, so they were known for their iron. So again, God chooses an appropriate metal. I also heard that they, they ruled with an iron fist, like they were so strict on everything. They were very strict, weren't they? Very, very strict. Uh, in another prophecy in Daniel 7, we're going to visit again Rome, and they're described as that. Just be very fierce, very strict, very harsh on people. So here you have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome predicted. One kingdom after another, and before they ever begin. Yeah. You know, except for Babylon. It's the here. And so Babylon is, uh, what, 605 to 538 B.C., so you're talking, what, 60, 70 years there, and God's calling out what the next kingdom's going to be. And he says that's going to be the Persian Empire, 538 to 331, so 200 years there. So now you're going to come down to Greece, which is like 300 years after Daniel's time, and God's saying Greece is going to be that kingdom. And then you're going to go down to 168 B.C., and now you're going to have Rome. Well, Greece and Rome were just little you know, city-states during this time, if they existed at all. They were just little things. And God says, no, they're going to be big, they're going to conquer, and they're going to be the predominant kingdom to rule that part of the world. So I wouldn't be able to do that, would you? No. To say what's <laughs> going to happen not. 300 years from now? <laughs> no. Which kingdom? No. It's amazing. So can we believe the Bible's inspired? I think, Absolutely. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, I, you know, if you have doubts about the Bible and you wonder, well, is there really a God? When you start seeing prophecy is predicting hundreds of years of history. In fact, when you take in the whole scope of Daniel 2, it's over 2,500 years of history before it ever happens. And it happens with great accuracy. And you have historians. Uh, Edward, Edward Gibbons was a historian from the 19th century. And he, he actually says these metals can rightly represent these kingdoms. And he's not even quoting the Bible because he wasn't even a Christian. Wow. And he uses the same metals to, to, to represent these kingdoms. Did you have a text you want to share? Yeah, I was just reminded of a, another historical account in Isaiah chapter 45, uh, begins in, in chapter 44 and goes into 45, mm -hmm. where he says that, who says of Cyrus, um, God speaking of a prophecy in Isaiah's day, this is before the Babylonian exile even happens. So a couple hundred years, right? Yeah. 150 or so. He mentions a man called Cyrus by name who says uh, in chapter 45 that he's going to subdue nations, loose the armor of kings, he's going to open before him the double door so the gates will not be shut. And this will be alluded to in Daniel's prophecy mm -hmm. that we'll see in, in a couple chapters, I think. That I'll go before you, make the crooked places straight, break in pieces the gates of irons, and cut the bars of iron, and I'll give you the treasures of darkness. And then he says, I've called you by your name for Jacob, my servant's sake. That's verse 3 into verse 4. And for Israel, my elect, I've called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There's no God besides me. In a previous chapter, he says, and I'll prove it to you. I know the future. Mm -hmm. And we see it here. He actually calls Cyrus by name who will overthrow Babylon on behalf of me to Persia for them to take charge. This is hundreds of years before the guy's even born, like 150 years. 150 years, 150 yeah. before he's born. And he calls him by name and says what he's going to do, and it happens exactly as he said. And he says that this is one of the ways that you'll know that I'm God. I'll tell you the end from the beginning, and things not yet known. And you know, if God knew Cyrus' name, he knows your name, your name, my name, your name. And he knows who we are, he knows where we are, and he has a plan for our lives as well. And that's one of the great things about prophecy. And, and that speaks to one of the purposes of prophecy, that it was to help Nebuchadnezzar know the thoughts of his own heart. And so as we go through prophecy, I expect God's going to speak to our hearts about things that we should be doing for him or could be doing and enjoying in him. Well, our time's about running out, so let's wrap it up here. So now we have the next thing that happens is the feet of iron and clay. 
And according to the pattern, you'd expect another kingdom. But what, does the, what is the interpretation? What's going to happen to the kingdom of Rome? It's not going to be overthrown by another kingdom, right? It says it's going to be what? Divided. It's going to be divided, right? And it's going to divide like the, uh, the iron and the clay, and it's not going to stick together. And so when you look at history, that's what happened. Rome just gradually fell apart to the barbarian tribes that invaded it. And uh, by the way, the barbarians had long hair and the Romans had short hair. And so what do we call a person that cuts a man's hair? A barber. A barber, right. And that's what it comes from. The barbarians oh, wow. were the long haired oh. people. So I once was a barbarian. I had, <laughs> I had really long hair. Now I'm more like a Roman because I'm losing that hair. But uh, so the barbarians uh, whittled away at the Roman Empire. And ultimately, you ended up with 10 nations, like the 10 toes on the image, the 10 nations. And those 10 nations, seven of them still existed to this day. So they're, they're the, uh, the nations of like England and Portugal and Germany and uh, Spain and Italy and France and Switzerland. Uh, so those seven still exist to this day. Three don't. Three have lost their place on earth. And that's predicted in Bible prophecy as well. And it becomes a significant clue in another prophecy in Daniel. So, and these, these nations have never been able to really stick together, mm. you know, and there have been many people who've tried to get them to cleave one to another, as the Bible says, mm -hmm. to make it one united Europe that wasn't warring against its, itself. So you know, there was Charlemagne, you know, the, the French king, Mussolini. Hitler, Mussolini, uh, different people have tried to unite Europe under one banner, one kingdom, and they've not been able to do it. Uh, fortunately, they've been able to you know, have agreements and periods of peace, and yet war keeps coming back. You know, it's, it's, it's a pity because war doesn't help anybody. It's just so self-destructive. And it's usually driven by somebody's selfishness and greed in, in each of these, you know, uh, megalomaniacs. They want to be over everything. And that's a little bit of Nebuchadnezzar, quite frankly, we'll see in this story as well. He wants to control everything. So here you have this fulfilled. By, by the beginning of World War I, all the ruling houses of Europe were related. They were cousins. They were all related. All the intermarriages that they had done. And they had married to try to unite Europe. That's right. And yet still didn't prevent World War I or World War II. So here's another fulfillment of this prophecy. In fact, it said that when Hitler was trying to conquer Europe, there were Christians, and we know this from history, there were Christians that said he's not going to succeed, even though it looked like he was going to succeed, because the prophecy says they'll not cleave one to another. So no, anybody who's tried to unite Europe under one kingdom has failed, because the Word of God says, the dream is certain, its interpretation is sure. And then we have the last thing that happens. That rock strikes the image on its feet. And that rock, the Bible says, is who? Who's the rock? Jesus. Jesus. Do we have a Bible text for that? I think we do. 1 Corinthians 10, right? I think it's about verse 4. Let me get over there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It is, verse 4. Okay, you want to read that for us? All drank that same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Yeah. So that's talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness, but the rock now becomes a symbol for Christ. Yes. Mm. And that's, again, how you use the Bible to interpret his own symbols. And, and in, even in Daniel, too, he says it's, it's God's kingdom. God will set up a kingdom that will last forever. So that represents the return of Jesus this earth. Some people have said, well, it's his first advent, his first coming as a babe. That, but he came during the time of Rome. And this rock is striking the image after Rome has fallen, right? So it's talking about his second coming. Plus, his coming is demolishing all the kingdoms of men. And then he's setting up his eternal kingdom. And as you jump to the back of the book of Revelation, that's what we see. One day God's kingdom is going to be set up here on this earth. And there will be no more sin, no more sorrow. No more crying, no more death. Mm. It's going to be a beautiful time, isn't it? Definitely. I think the most important question for us to ask ourselves, what does it mean to me? What difference does it make in my life? What, what do you get out of this, Christy? What difference does this make in your life knowing this prophecy? Uh, I think it's, it's quite humbling, but also very encouraging to see that someone cared so much about what we would be going through now mm -hmm. <laughs> that he told us thousands of years before we even got here. <laughs> yeah. That's like, 
that's so like you're so small and like so little and insignificant but he cares that much i'm like wow that's that's like so sweet so precious to me it gives so much hope you know as, as you look through history there are different periods where people looked and found themselves on this prophetic timeline. And I, I think about one person, I forget his name, he said uh, it was during the time of the breakup of the Roman Empire, and he said the Roman Empire is falling, but we lift up our heads, you know, because he, and he, said, he, he puts it in Daniel, he talks about the legs of iron and all, and so he says, but we lift up our heads, there's hope, there's hope after this, and there's hope right now when we live in a world that's just fragment and divide it and people aren't cleaving one to another. There's hope. God's kingdom is coming. And, and that's the hope that I take from it as well, that God knows us. He knows where we are and God has a purpose for us. So I'm an American citizen, but I'm a citizen of God's kingdom as well. And the next kingdom that's coming is God's kingdom. And I think that's the most important thing that we can kind of figure out for ourselves. And what difference does it make? Am I a child of the next kingdom? because it's a kingdom now in our hearts, but one day it's gonna be a literal physical kingdom and we'll be there if we've given our hearts to Jesus first. So that's so important for us to understand. That's what God was after with Nebuchadnezzar and I believe that's what he's after with us as well. So why don't we end with prayer and, and let's pray together. Father in heaven, I wanna thank you so much that like Christy said, you care for us, you, you care for the, human family and that you've given a roadmap through time and through life uh, in this simple prophecy of Daniel 2. And you've made it a master key to unlock all the prophecies, the timeline prophecies of the Bible and Daniel and Revelation, but you've also made it a master key to our lives as we open our hearts to you. Lord, we want you in our hearts. We want to experience that beautiful kingdom where there's eternal peace that you've designed us for. So come into our lives and help us to know you more. And I th pray through these studies and our sharing together that we'll just grow to love you more, to know you more, to understand your word and your will for our lives. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you for, for sharing today. And I want to thank you for sharing with us and being with us. And you're watching this maybe with somebody else or maybe just by yourself in your home. I hope it's been a blessing to you. We have more studies coming. In fact, our next lesson is called the Mark of the Beast issue. Now, when you hear about the Mark of the Beast, a lot of people get afraid, you know, because it's, it's in horror stories. But we're going to share something from Daniel about the Mark of the Beast that I think you'll find very comforting and very enlightening. In fact, Dee and Christy, a lot of the stuff that's talked about with the Mark of the Beast is just myth. Mm -hmm. It's not in the Bible whatsoever. And in fact, the whole idea that the Mark of the Beast is 666 is not biblical. Mm -hmm. There's 666 in the Bible, but the Bible never says it's the Mark of the Beast. And so if you've heard that, we'll show you in our next study how that isn't true. And what the, we'll talk about the issue of the mark of the beast. We won't go into all the details because we need to figure out who the beast is. But we're going to talk about the mark of the beast issue. So I look forward to seeing you next week. Now, between now and then, I'm going to give you a study guide, right? And what I'd like to encourage you to do, and you who are watching this, to take your study guide and read through it on your own and fill in the blanks. And, and this is key to the New King James Bible. And that's the Bible we're using here on our program. You can use any other Bible, but the fill in the blanks are Bible texts. Uh, New King James will work best for you. You can get it on your phone or your computer if you don't have a paper copy, or just go to a real bookstore and pick up one. I think you'll find it'd be a blessing. And so just read through the study and uh, mark anything. If you have any questions, put a question mark by it. You can ask if you're studying with someone, uh, you can ask them the next week what it might mean, and they might be able to help you figure that out and we'll be talking about uh, it as well in our next study. So you get the study guide, make it your own. Study it on your own this, this coming week. And we look forward to seeing you in our next time together as we study the Mark of the Beast issue. Hi, I'm Gary Gibbs. I hope that you enjoyed our first lesson here in Prophecies of Hope. Uh, you can see the interaction that we have here with uh, Dee and Christy, type of things we're getting into. It's just the beginning of a lot of good things. We're sharing here in Prophecies of Hope 
tools to unlock the meaning to Bible prophecy. It seems complicated at first, but it really isn't, as you saw demonstrated in this first lesson as we looked at Daniel chapter 2. That lesson truly becomes the master key to unlocking all the other prophecies. And we've got some really exciting, great things coming. Uh, the next lesson, we'll dive into uh, Daniel chapter 3. If you want to read ahead of time, I want to encourage you to read Daniel 3 with Revelation 13. These introductory lessons are just to give you some of the tools, the basic tools, unlock Bible prophecy, give you a taste of it. Uh, they're introductory lessons, but if you want to go deeper and you want to do the full series, you're welcome to do that after lesson four. But we're going to be studying in the extended series. We're going to look at some really very interesting things. We're going to look at the Bible's longest time prophecy uh, that reaches closest to our day. We'll look at the most impressive proof that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, a prophecy that dictated every aspect of his life. It's found in Daniel chapter 9. We're going to answer questions like, what happens when a person dies? What does the Bible say about that? We're going to talk about the rise of spiritualism and mysticism and why that's so prevalent today. We'll look at how Jesus is going to come back to planet Earth. We're going to look at what the Bible says. We'll be looking at Bible text and letting one text explain the other. You'll have the uh, study guide like you received today, and you'll be able to go through it and study it out on your own. And really, I want to encourage you to do that because Prophecies of Hope is not about telling people what to believe. It's about helping them come to their own spirit-led conclusions. And once you get the tools to letting the Bible interpret itself, it's not as hard as many people think. So thank you for joining us here for Prophecies of Hope today. And I look forward to our next study together as we do these introductory studies. Mm -hmm.